Good morning and a very warm welcome to our online worship at Shettleston New today. Psalm 46 encourages us to be still and know that I am God. So let's take a moment to do that just now before we sing God's praises. Let us pray. Loving God, you gave the prophet Isaiah a glimpse into the throne room of heaven, and he heard the angels calling out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And it is our desire this morning to join in that chorus of praise, proclaiming your holiness, that you are set apart from this sinful world, that you are perfect in love and in unity, wisdom and power, compassion and strength. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so your ways are higher than our ways. And yet, you want to draw close to us. And so you sent your son to win us back for you, offering his life on the cross to redeem us from sin rising again to show us that death was defeated and continuing to guide us and transform us through your spirit. And so we want to give you all our thanks and our praise. We ask that we would indeed draw close to you this morning to know your presence with us 
and hear your voice speaking into our hearts. Transform us into the likeness of your Son, we pray. And we follow his example just now as we join together in the words that he taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. As we continue into 2021 amidst these difficult times, we're going to go back to basics over the next few weeks and focus on Mark's Gospel. Now, Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels and in many ways the most action packed. He tends to place more emphasis on what Jesus did rather than on what Jesus said. And you'll find that the events of Jesus' life come pouring out very quickly in the weeks ahead. But today, we're really just going to focus on one story because it is very foundational to all that will follow. So let's listen as Janie reads the first 11 verses of Mark's Gospel to us. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you. Who will prepare your way? A voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptised by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt round his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Amen. Come on, wake up. The big day is here. You're going to miss it. <sighs> okay, okay. Ah, I'm awake. The theologian N.T. Wright suggests the start of Mark's gospel is a bit like that scene. You're sound asleep, dreaming away happily, when suddenly your dozing is interrupted by a voice calling out to you to, to get up and pay attention, followed by a, a splash of cold water just to ram the point home. You need to get your eyes open very quickly and pay attention. And Mark is certainly keen to get into the action with his story. By contrast, the other gospel writers um, take a different approach. John, he goes back to the dawn of time to set the scene for the start of his gospel. If you remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Matthew, well, he goes for a, a genealogy going all the way back to Abraham to start his gospel, quickly followed by 
a short description of Christ's birth from the perspective of Joseph. And he then shares the story of the wise men and their gifts. And Luke gives us Mary's account of the birth of Jesus, complete with angels and shepherds. But with Mark, the first time we see Jesus is as a grown man at his baptism. He is the gospel writer who always wants to cut to the chase. Although even he does a little bit of scene setting here. His opening sentence tells us that his gospel is all about Jesus, that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that what he is telling us is good news. Now the word Messiah is a Hebrew one that literally means the anointed one. The Greek word Christos, from which we get our English word Christ, means exactly the same thing. For the people living in Palestine in the first century, it referred to the one anointed by God, the promised successor to King David, who would rescue God's people. The term Son of God was another title for this Messiah. And perhaps one of the reasons that Mark doesn't talk about Jesus' conception and birth is that he wants to emphasise something particular about this title. Because back in the first century, titles or nicknames were often given because they said something about someone's character. So, for example, in the book of Acts, we meet a man from Cyprus called Joseph, although you probably know him better by his nickname, Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Barnabas was just a really encouraging guy to be around. He always saw the best in people. He was willing to give folk another chance, to see the good in folk that other people had written off, and to come alongside them and give them a helping hand when they needed it. Barnabas just seemed like the living embodiment of encouragement. Encouragement personified, you might say. And so he was nicknamed Son of Encouragement. And so the Messiah was also known as the Son of God. He would be the living embodiment of God, God in the flesh, so to speak. And his arrival on earth would be good news. And in his gospel, Mark is going to give us evidence that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the Son of God, and that his arrival really is good news. So there's a lot we can take out of that first verse. And then Mark continues with a little more scene setting as he quotes from two Old Testament prophets, Malachi and Isaiah, who describe how the Lord would send a messenger ahead of himself to prepare the way helping people to get ready for the Messiah's arrival. And this was John the Baptist. He comes out of the desert looking like the prophet Elijah centuries before, dressed in his camel hair clothes. He tells people that they need to repent, to change the direction their lives are heading in, to turn away from sin and turn back to God. And huge crowds flock to hear his message and to ask forgiveness as they confess their sins and are then baptised, a very visible symbol of their decision to repent. But John's message goes further. This This baptism isn't an end in itself. It's part of getting ready for the one who is to come, the promised Messiah. He would do more than baptise with water. He would baptise with the Holy Spirit. And for those of us that live after the first century, we have the advantage of the rest of the New Testament to help us understand what that means. The Greek word baptizo means to immerse, to wash clean. And the Holy Spirit baptises us when we put our faith in Jesus. We are washed clean so we can take our place as part of the family of God. As Paul tells the Corinthians, For we were all baptised by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. 
at this point, I actually have to confess that I came across a wee typo as I was reviewing this sermon. Obviously, my brain was still struggling to get going after my rude awakening earlier, because when I'd written out the Holy Spirit, I'd spelt his name W-H-O-L-L-Y. But on reflection, perhaps it was a providential mistake, because the Holy Spirit does indeed make us wholly spotless in the sight of God. We are washed wholly clean by the Spirit, as far as God is concerned. And we need to remember that. Anyway, to come back to the passage, as John had prophesied, Jesus did indeed come to the Jordan to be baptised. And Mark's description of this event is short and characteristically to the point, with the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus in the form of a dove, anointing him as God's chosen Messiah. And Jesus sees heaven being torn open, giving him a glimpse of the spiritual reality beyond this world. Maybe even a glimpse of his heavenly father, whose side he had left 30 years ago when he came to the earth. Now that's speculation on my part, but he certainly heard the voice of his father, hearing the the most wonderful words of affirmation. You are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. And so, in the space of just 11 verses, we've seen Old Testament prophets pointing towards the coming Messiah. We've seen John the Baptist saying he is coming any day now. And we've had God the Father announce in no uncertain terms that he has arrived in the form of Jesus with the Holy Spirit descending from heaven to back up that claim. But the amazing thing about this statement is that Jesus hasn't done anything yet. This is his first appearance in Mark's Gospel. And even in the other Gospels, there is no mention of Jesus doing anything as an adult before he he arrives at the Jordan to be baptised. God is well pleased with his son, not because of what he has done, but because of who he is. And the good news is that if we've put our faith in Jesus, if we've we've been baptised by the Holy Spirit into the family of God, then God feels just the same way about us. That came home to me at a Christian conference over 20 years ago. A Church of Scotland minister called Kenny Borthwick was praying for me. And Kenny is particularly gifted at hearing what the Lord is saying. And he turned to me and said, The Lord wants you to know, Louis, that he's terribly pleased with you. He really is. And that was a a huge encouragement to me. But those words equally apply to you. He is well pleased with you simply because You are his child. It doesn't matter what you've done wrong or what you failed to do. It doesn't matter what you'll get wrong tomorrow. God is well pleased with you. He loves you. If you've come to faith and been baptised by the Holy Spirit, then God sees you not as you are in yourself, but as you are in Jesus, holy and spotless. So, we have a a lot of Margarets in the church. And to each of you, God says, Margaret, you are my child whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Now, I can't go through saying the names of everyone in the church or we'd be here all day. So instead, we're going to do this. Please please take a look at the words on screen. Insert your own name into the blank and then say the words slowly, either out loud or to yourself. But then let those words sink into your soul because they come from the very heart of God. So I'll give you a moment to do that 
честно. Please, please, hold on to that wonderful truth that God loves you and is well pleased with you. You don't need to earn that approval. Jesus has already done that for you. The author Philip Yancey puts it like this. There is nothing we can do to make God love us more. There is nothing we can do to make God love us less. We simply get to enjoy being children of God. But that doesn't mean we should feel free to do whatever we like. Although God won't lo love us any less if we fall into sin, it's not what he wants for us. And it's not what we should be wanting if our desire is to love God. And so that means we have a couple of challenges arising from today's passage. Firstly, some of us may need to wake up spiritually. It's very easy for us to start sleepwalking our way through this life. We've not lost our faith in Jesus, but it doesn't really affect our lives much day to day anymore. It's very rare that we pick up a Bible or, or offer a prayer. Jesus simply doesn't enter our thoughts from one day to the next. And if that's the case, please let this morning be a wake-up call to you. Hopefully a more gentle one than having water splashed in your face, but frankly, whatever it takes. Make the decision that you want to wake up spiritually and then ask the Holy Spirit to help you. His role isn't simply to baptise us when we come to faith, but it's also to help us grow in Christian character, to remind us of the words of Jesus and to inspire and equip us to serve him. But of course, we need to play our part, turning to God's word regularly. Maybe you'd like to sit down and, and read Mark's gospel to help you get going spiritually again. It's only 16 chapters, so it won't take too long. Or maybe join the house group that Douglas is running. And above all, get back to praying regularly. If you're not sure what to pray, you could use the Lord's Prayer as a start of a 10 and just go from there. But please, make sure you, you wake up spiritually. It won't make God love you any more than he already does. But it will help you to express your love for him so much better. Secondly, many of us may need to repent. For some that might mean repenting for the first time, acknowledging that we are sinners and going on to place our faith in Jesus, accepting him as our Lord and Saviour. If that's, if that's you, please get in touch with me and I'll, I'll talk you through all this. But for most of us, we've made that commitment already. But we can still find ourselves wandering from the path. Maybe lockdown has led to us becoming more self-centred, less concerned about others because we aren't seeing them at the moment. Or maybe we've become very cynical or very quick to criticise others. Or maybe we've started watching some things that deep down we know we shouldn't. They just aren't helpful to our Christian walk. Whatever it is, we're called to admit it before God. To say sorry and ask for his help to change direction. And his spirit will help us to do that. But we need to decide that we really do want to give up going the wrong way, even if it's just in a small area of our lives and get back on the path that the Lord wants us to follow. But the most important point for you to take away from this morning is those words that the father speaks to Jesus at his baptism. They are the words that he speaks to us if we are part of his family. You are my child whom I love. With you I am well pleased. 
May those words reverberate through your heart today and always. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that wonderful affirmation that you gave your son. And we thank you that you give us that same affirmation, that you love us and are well pleased with us. Help that precious truth sink deep into our hearts, we pray. And our desire is to respond to you in love. And so we ask that you would help us to wake up spiritually, Help us to stop dozing and to start living, even if we need a splash of water in the face to get us going. Your son said that he came so that we might have life and have it to the full. Help us to step into that sort of life, we pray. But even when we are spiritually awake, we often still make mistakes, often choose the wrong path. Show us when we do this so that we might turn back to you. We thank you that our failures don't make you love us any less, but that you love us too much to leave us like that. And so you seek to bring us back to the right path. Help us to listen for your spirit's leading, we pray. And especially in these difficult times, We pray for his wisdom, for us as individuals, as a nation and across the world. Help us to chart the right path, not only in the fight against COVID-19, but also in all aspects of life. We pray for your church. May we be humble and faithful like John the Baptist, seeking to point people to Jesus. We pray for all who need your comfort and consolation, healing and hope just now. We remember all those facing loss, the loss of loved ones and the sadness of saying goodbye and the ongoing heartache of grief. We remember those facing the loss of their health or their livelihood, their contact with friends and family or simply their happiness. May they find in you comfort for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Lord, hear our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn goes to the tune of the Skyboat Song. Spirit of God, unseen as the wind, gentle as is the dove.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.